All righty. The people I do not see are Denford and Michaela. Let's get started. It is April Fool's Day, and I will have no April Fool's jokes. Um, you should have your test scores uploaded at this point. Is that correct? Okay, because I, I leave that to my office worker to get those uploaded. And homework is up to date, so almost everything is up to date on your grades. Um, there were a few people who had low scores. I haven't actually analyzed the first test or the second test to look at corrections I should make to those. Um, so there might be some changes. But you know, if you scored less than, let's say, 50%, it would be good to come talk to me so we can try to figure out how to get better score on the final exam. You know, because that, that is, I want everybody to get high grade, or at least to see. And so, you know, getting less than 50% doesn't help that. Okay, we're going to continue with electricity, and this is chapter 13 now. There's going to be a fair amount of review of stuff we did in lab last Monday. So I'm going to go reasonably quickly through that review stuff. So you notice this title, what is electric current? Well, tell me, what is electric current? Okay, it's the rate at which electricity flows. And when I say electricity flows, I mean charge flows. Now, what is actually flowing? It's electrons. It's negative charge that's actually flowing. So let's go through these slides, and we'll go through reasonably quickly. Can you get a flashlight bulb to light with a battery and a single wire? Now, I don't have a clicker question for this. This is just an opinion poll. Really, just opinion. What do you think? Can you make it happen? He says yes. He says if you have a knife. Well, this bulb is a flashlight bulb, and it will, it will turn on with the roughly 1.5 volts of a battery. So the bulb can be lit by 1.5 volts. And remember, that's not a battery. Maybe that's why I can't write neatly, because it's actually a cell. Did I make it clear the difference in a battery and a cell? And why these are the D cells, the kinds of things that you throw at Chiefs and Broncos players? Don't really, but uh, Neil Smith accused Raider fans of throwing D cells at him. You know how he was with the Chiefs at that point. Those guys will exaggerate anything. Um, they were probably C cells. Okay, so <laughs> a D cell is a single voltaic cell. That is, it is something like, that has a chemical reaction that gives energy to charge. We talked about the batteries giving energy to charge. So this here, it's just one cell. Now, if you zoom in, you can actually see that right here, it tells you the voltage. That's a 1.2 volt D cell. Is it jumping up there? Because okay. <laughs> it was here too. I was like, oh. So it's a 1.2 volt chemical cell. It has a chemical reaction that will give charge 1.2 volts. What is a volt? How do you break that down? One volt is equal to one blank per blank. Joule per coulomb, it's the potential energy per charge. It's the electric potential, which is potential energy per charge. So a battery, well, here's how you draw a cell. A cell is drawn like this with a long line and a short line. The long line is always the positive side. The short line is the negative side. Here's how you draw a battery. So I'll change to red for the battery. And by the way, if you're wondering about my pronunciation of battery, you can... Just review Eddie Murphy's Delirious album. There's one point where he says, Say, man, someone stole your battery. I was in high school when that album came out, and it made me change the way I pronounced the word. It forced it on me. There's how we draw a battery. What does the battery look like? You're like, what? It looks like two cells. 
Or sometimes we'll even make it look like three. Because that's what a battery is. A battery is a battery of cells. It's a collection of cells that are put together one after the other. So in your car battery, and yeah, I, I am fluid on how I pronounce it. In your car battery, you have something like 12 volts. If it's made out of 1.5 volt cells, how many cells are you going to have to add together to get to 12 volts? Okay, 8 times 1.5 is 12. So you'd have to have 8 1.5 volt cells. Now the actual number of cells, there are different kinds of cells they can make that put out different voltages. Some car batteries put out like 14 and a half volts. So, you know, the number of cells in there may vary. Okay, the answer to this question, I had some polling and I had a few answers. Can we light the bulb? What do we need to make that bulb turn on? Okay, we have to have a circuit. We have to have the positive attached to one side and the negative attached to the other with a circuit, with a loop. So if I can make a loop with a single wire, I can make it happen. And of course, I have the picture to prove you can. If you wrap it around or spot weld or solder the wire onto the outer portion of the light bulb, and then you connect that to one pole of the battery, and you connect the, well, this picture won't work. I shouldn't look at that one. It won't work. Why won't it work? Because you're not connected to the negative side. For the battery, this is the positive side, this is the negative side. And you're only connected to the positive side. No looping. No working. This one here, what is the wire doing? It's going from the positive side of the battery to the negative side of the cell. The positive side of the cell to the negative side of the cell we would say that's shorting out the battery. It's making a short circuit. It's making a direct connection from one side of the power source to the other side, which means that all of your charge is just going to flow in that wire. Nothing would go through the light bulb. This one here is the one that works, as you can see by the yellow, because you have the wire attached to one part of the light bulb, and then the bottom of the light bulb is on positive. The part that's attached goes to negative. And now the charge has to go through the bulb. Now, one thing in case that doesn't make sense, the way they make a light bulb, this part of the light bulb is connected to one side of a filament. So you have a filament, a piece of wire. The other side of that filament goes down through the center and is connected to this piece at the bottom. And in between those, you have a bunch of insulating material so that there's no electrical connection between this, the green wire and the red wire except for through that blue filament. So when you look at that light bulb, I know when I was a child, I looked at a light bulb and I was like, oh, aren't those all connected together? But they're not. <laughs> they're carefully separated so that you have, with this picture, with picture C, positive is connected right here. And negative is connected here. Now, what is actually flowing through that wire again? Electrons. So what's going to happen is electrons are going to flow from the negative side to positive. Why? Because negative charge is attracted to positive. So that's what electrons are going to do. And some people talk about this as electron current. But we in physics don't talk about electron current. We talk about conventional current.
Conventional current is the rate at which positive charge flows. Does positive charge flow? No. It's electrons that flow. But electrons flowing this direction is equivalent to positive charge flowing the opposite direction. And so conventional current goes just the opposite. Conventional current goes like this. It goes from the positive to the negative. So when we talk about current, we're not talking about the flow of electrons per se. We're talking about the flow of a mythical positive charge. Unless you have something like, let's say you have salt water. If you have salt water, you put table salt, sodium chloride in there. The sodium and the chloride dissociated, and now you have positive and negative ions, things that are charged particles. And so when you put a voltage difference across that water, you'll have positive ions traveling the direction of the conventional current, and you'll have negative ions traveling the opposite direction, and the two will combine to give you the total current. So the conventional current is not completely ridiculous because you do have positive and negative charge flow in certain situations. But in a wire, it is not what is happening. But it still explains perfectly the outcomes. I'm going a lot slower than I anticipated at 1.30 this morning. So I don't remember how carefully I talked about the units of current in lab. I remember that my tablet's battery went dead, and that kind of curtailed my lecture at that point. So current is the rate at which charge passes. I know I talked about that. And so since charge has units of coulombs, time has units of seconds, then the unit for current is a coulomb per second. But we have a name for that, the ampere. So an amp, ampere is shortened to amp, is a coulomb per second. Now remember, what's the charge of an electron? Big or small? Really, really small. Electrons have a charge, which we just used the letter E for, this 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So to get one amp of current, which is not unreasonable, these wall sockets in the laboratory, they I think can go up to like 20 amps. Um, actually, yeah, I haven't checked. At home, they're usually a standard outlet will go up to 15 amps. To get 15 amps, you're going to have to have somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 20th electrons per second passing. That's a huge number of electrons per second passing by. But of course, the wires have Googles of electrons in them probably. Well, no, they probably don't. Let me, let me back off a little bit. Right, Google is 10 to the 100. They don't have that many electrons. But they have a very large number of electrons in them. And so it's not an inconceivable number. All right, moving forward, at least I only spent two minutes on that slide, at which rate I would almost finish the lecture. Oh, look, here's a nice picture of what I described about the light bulb and how it works. Isn't that lovely? See what I was talking about with the wires connected to the filament? It looks almost exactly the same, except for this is drawn by someone with artistic talent. It's the only real difference. How does it make light? This filament here has a resistance. Now, you learned about resistance in lab. Resistance essentially means that the electrons can't flow freely through it, that there's some resistance to electrons going through. The name is very descriptive. So you might think of it like, this is the example I always use. Back when I was in graduate school, the football team had this little thing that had concrete pylons. They're about two inches in diameter on one end and one and a half at the other end. And they're set up so they're pointing toward the center and there's a little maybe foot wide section in between. And the idea is football players run through 
and they're holding the ball, and that's acting like other football players trying to grab the ball out of their arms. And so I'm going to the gym, I'm like, you know, I always want to play football. I wonder what it's like. So I went running through that thing. First of all, it turns out that having concrete hitting your bare arms isn't fun. It, it really kind of hurt, and I wish I had some kind of padding. Um, but number two, it supplied a resistance. Did it stop me? Oh, heck no. I busted through that thing like a pro. It just hurt a lot. But I had to put energy in, right? If I just came and tried to coast, it would have stopped me because it was resisting me going through. And so I had to add additional energy to keep going. One of your homework problems from, I think it was the most recent, I don't know, it may not have been the most recent assignment, one of the two that I graded yesterday, had to do with a car, and it says where or why do you have to have power to keep a car traveling? The answer is air resistance. You have air that is going to try to stop the car. The faster you go, the more it tries to slow down the car. So the faster you go, the higher the resistance, the more energy you're going to have to supply per, se per second. What do we call energy per second? The rate at which energy is converted or delivered or used? Not work. Work is energy. Right? It's a transfer of energy. But the rate, the amount of work per time, is called power. And so the car has to supply power to overcome the resistance and its motion because the work is force times distance. The power is going to be force times distance per time. Distance per time is speed. So the power is force times speed. So this resistor is resisting charge going through. And the faster you make the charge go through, the faster energy is used, the more power that the resistor is going to take. So you have energy per time power that is being taken out of the electricity. Now, if you take energy out of the electricity, that means the potential energy per charge is moving which direction? Take away energy, the potential energy is going down. So that means, what do we call the potential energy per charge? We have a name for it. The voltage or the electric potential is dropping. So when the charge goes through a resistor, its voltage drops, the potential drops, because energy is taken out. Where does that energy go? Well, for this filament, it goes into light. Light is a form of energy. Now, I say it goes into light. Five percent light. <laughs> That's kind of sad, isn't it? Where's the other 95% go? You guys are up on this. Heat. That's why incandescent light bulbs are being phased out by law in the United States. Right? You cannot purchase a 60-watt incandescent bulb anymore. Right? They... They've been banned from manufacturing them since, I think, 2013. And it's when the supply ends that you can't get them anymore. And I think you're going to be pretty hard-pressed to find an incandescent light bulb that's a 60-watt. Now, they'll still sell 100 watts. I think that's how it works, but not 60 watts. Because there's a lot of energy lost to heat with that. If you change to something like a compact fluorescent or an LED, I'm much more excited about the LEDs. Um, compact fluorescence, you know, like it's a cold day, it's not as efficient, and it's not nearly as bright. So my wife goes into her ba bathroom, it's got like a bank of six compact fluorescents, turns them on, and you can see a little bit because it's really dim on a cold day. On a warm day, it's fine. Those two are somewhere around 30% efficient. Now, 30% efficient still sounds sad. That's similar to the efficiency of an automobile engine. But it's a whole lot better than 5%. It's six times better. Which means if you switch from an incandescent bulb to an equivalent LED or compact fluorescent bulb, you're going to pay about one-sixth in electric power 
for the lighting of your house. On the other hand, my experience with compact fluorescents is they don't last very long. They claim these enormous lifespans, but they seem to break in a, somewhere between three months and two years, my experience. Another reason I'm looking forward to cheaper LED bulbs. Okay, so we got that squared away on what's happening with the light bulb. Um, little historical note before we answer this question. It's not going to let you answer right now, but you might want to get your clickers out. What do you know about the invention of the light bulb? Thomas Edison. Yeah, <laughs> many, many tries. Now, he did not actually invent the idea. In fact, I read something. I, I told you about that article I read about things you were taught that were incorrect. And according to that article, and I haven't fact-checked it at all, he actually purchased a patent for a light bulb. So what he did was to come up with the idea. What he did do was get a way to make it work for longer than three seconds. At that point, they were basically taking carbon, or not carbon, that was the key, cotton filaments and putting electricity through them. And you make the cotton hot, and what happens? It lights on fire. They were essentially making flash bulbs. That wasn't what he wanted, but that's what they were doing. And so he came up with an idea of carbonizing them, of putting a carbon material that coated it so that the cotton didn't catch fire and you'd have it last longer. So what he actually came up with was a light bulb that didn't immediately destroy itself. Now, there's still controversy on if he should get credit. There were people in Europe doing the same thing at the same time. So Europeans will say, no, Edison didn't invent it. I don't know the name because I'm not a European. He did. There is a third thing that people will claim. The person that, okay, just like with all major scientific things, it turns out Edison wasn't the person who was doing the, the work. He was the one that was overseeing ideas. And so he had a person that was doing the carbonizing of the cotton for him. And so some people claim that's the person who should get credit because he's the one who actually did the work. The way things traditionally go, it's the idea person that gets the credit, and so that's why it's Edison that gets the credit here. But, you know, there's different, different perspectives on that situation historically. Okay, so, assuming the computer wakes up, now you can go ahead and answer. Two arrangements of a battery, bulb, and wire are shown below. Which of the two arrangements will light the bulb? A, B, neither, or both? <laughs> it, it could be any one of those four answers. <laughs> Depends on how tricky you think you are. Okay, we did not agree. We have no majority, but we have two equal answers. Let's discuss among ourselves. We're kind of separate here. Let's make one side of the classroom discuss together, the other side of the classroom discuss together, just so we can, you know, have people to talk to. Actually, you can talk to them if you're more comfortable. It doesn't matter to me. Whichever, you're going to have to travel. <laughs> <laughs> well, the light bulb's on its side. We have a light bulb on the battery. I tried this. <laughs> you know, if I had them handy, I would, because hands on is worth a lot more than me talking. But I, yeah, no, I don't have them handy. Sorry. I, I will try to remember next year and just have them handy and let students do it because that is a, a good solution. Okay, let's, uh, let's try this again. 
I can tell that I'm never going to make it to the end of today's lecture. I have like a whole bunch of clicker questions. Okay. This time we had the person who said B change their vote. Everyone else was unconvinced. Now we saw a picture before. I saw Daisy point to the picture in the book. We had the picture in the book. Well, we had one just like B. And what did it tell us about B? Doesn't work. Why not? Okay, so this one can't be right because no closed circuit. Okay, now we look at A. We didn't have a picture that looked exactly like A, which is why I kept it for a second. Does A have a closed circuit? Yes, yes it does. Because it's touching the negative side of the battery there, and then the positive side of the battery there. Is that going to work? Yes. So A will work. <laughs> I take it you were right, Daisy. <laughs> it's good to be right. In fact, arrangement A is really the same arrangement as was shown in the textbook, except for the wire has been shifted. The wire before was going negative to the side. Now it's going positive to the bottom. You actually have current going the same direction. But for resistor, the resistor doesn't care what direction the current goes. So you could have had, I heard people over here talking about the direction. It doesn't matter which direction the current is going. In fact, with our light bulbs that we use, now these aren't incandescents, these are fluorescents, I believe. They might be sodium. Um, we use alternating current, which means the current is going back and forth in both directions. But it still makes the light bulb turn on. Okay, water analogy. We've already talked water analogy to death, right? Because we got through that before the battery went dead in my tablet. In the water analogy, the battery is like a pump. The electric charge is like the water. Connecting wires are like a thick pipe, a thick pipe so it has very little resistance. The filament is like a narrow pipe, something that's going to have a reasonable amount of resistance, and switches like the valve. These obviously should not be separately bulleted. The switch and the valve. We didn't talk about that, but that's pretty obvious. So that's something I'm going to move right past. In the circuit that's shown here, it's going to take me two clicks, are the wires, um, the wires are connected to either side of a wooden block as well as to the light bulb. Will the light bulb light in this arrangement? Okay, two, four, one. Four is a simple majority here, four out of seven. And four is correct. Somebody who answered four, can you tell the class why? Because wood is an insulator. Now we learned you can put charge on an insulator, but it won't move. And so you won't have a completed circuit because the charge won't move across the insulator. Now, if instead of wood, that had been a metal block, well, then it works because the metal would have been a conductor. I told you a lot of clicker questions. <laughs> In the circuit shown, could we incre I took out like five questions from what I originally had. In the circuit shown, could we increase the brightness of the bulb by connecting a wire between A and B? That is... Would it make the bulb brighter if I put a wire right here? So, just in case you're wondering, this here is showing the light bulb. It's just a, a lazier way of showing a light bulb.
Okay, we had some people correct their answers, which is good. The correct answer? No. No, it won't. Okay, last time Andrew answers to somebody besides Andrew who answered it correctly. Why not? Okay. Elect electricity likes to take the easiest route. It doesn't have to be the shortest in distance, but the easiest. And we call it a short circuit when it's the easiest. So I can see you using the word short. Electricity likes to take the easiest route. How much resistance do I have between A and B if I put a nice wire in there? None. And I have resistance for that light bulb. So the electricity comes to A... And it says, I've got a choice to make. Of course, electricity is not really thinking, but physics says, I've got a choice to Okay, physics isn't thinking either. There is a choice to be made. Do I go the hard way or the easy way? Either one will get me to the end. And the charge says, easy way, easy way. And so the charge goes through that short wire from A to B, and nothing will go through the light bulb, hence the light bulb won't turn on. And that's, that's what a short circuit is. Uh-oh. <laughs> you can really read really well in that black background. Um, but this is just Ohm's Law, and we've talked about Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law is relating the current that goes through a resistor to the voltage difference. If the current is going, as I showed here, from left to right... It's losing energy as it goes through, so the voltage is going down when you go through it because energy is being converted into something else. The resistors get hot because the energy is going to thermal energy, heating things up. And so Ohm's Law is relating those, and <clears throat> Ohm's Law, remember, I wrote it three ways in lab because I thought it was funny. V equals IR. Well, the final of those three ways was R is equal to V over I. So the resistance is the ratio of the voltage drop to the current going through. And so if you look at the units, that would have units of voltage is joules per coulomb, and current is coulombs per second. So that would be a joule times a second per coulomb squared. You'll never see that, ever. Because we simply say that's an ohm, and we use the omega, capital omega now, to indicate resistance units of ohms. So an ohm is a joule times second per coulomb squared. Or as it says in something you actually can read, a volt per ampere. And I'm going to move on because that slide, I had an unfortunate color choice. I hope I didn't repeat it. Okay, two signs, two for us to consider. One says, danger, 100,000 ohms. The other says, danger, 10,000 volts. Which one scares you? Good change, Zach. Good change. Everybody agrees. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. Now, I'm going to go a little off track because this is kind of an important thing. How your body reacts to electricity has to do with current. So current in milliamperes, what does milli mean? That's right. 10 to the minus 3, it's 1 1,000th. So milliamps are 1 1,000th of amps. So if I have a current of about 1 milliamp, I feel the burn. Right? You get a little shock. 
gets up to about 10 milliamps, then I have involuntary muscle contraction. Okay, contraction isn't going to fit there. If you get up to somewhere in the ballpark of 50 to 70 milliamps, it's not an exact number, then that, if it's going across the heart, is enough to cause cardiac... Oh boy, I don't know how to spell arrhythmia. I really don't. Hmm, cardiac problems. You get up to about 1,000, and it's enough to start burning you. Now, that's, these are rough numbers. But let's talk about safety. Is one milliamp safe when you feel the burn? Yeah. We've all been shocked a time or two. We take 9-volt batteries. If you put a 9-volt battery on your skin, what do you feel? Nothing. If you put it on your tongue, what do you feel? What? You feel a burn. Depending on the 9-volt battery, it might be a lot of burn. Why is it different? That's exactly it. The saliva on top of your tongue has a pretty low resistance. And so you have 9 volts divided by a low resistance... And you have a fairly high current, a current that's, you know, I actually don't know how big the current is, so a current that's reasonable in size. You put it on your skin, your skin has resistance on the order of, let's say, 2 kilo ohms. It depends on if your skin is wet or dry, it could be higher, it could be lower. But if it was 2 kilo ohms, 9 volts divided by 2 kilo ohms, is equal to 4.5 milliamps. So if it's 2 kilo ohms, you actually might feel a little bit. If it was up to, let's say, 10 kilo ohms, you wouldn't feel anything. Right, so usually you don't feel anything, which means your skin's resistance is probably more like 10 kilo ohms or better, because you don't feel it. So that's why 9-volt battery, put it on your tongue, sizzle, put it on your skin, not up. Now you get up to 10 milliamps, you start to have involuntary muscle contraction. So how many people have like gone to the chiropractor and they put these little, they call it e-stim, you put these pads on your shoulder or on your back, and then they turn up the electricity and it kind of feels like they're jabbing ice picks in, and you start having muscle contractions. Rachel definitely has. Anyone else? I love this stuff, especially because things like I haven't put on my shoulder and if I relax, my shoulder will go like th I, I always have them crank it up really high. If I relax, my shoulder will go like this. But I can use other muscles to force it down. But those muscles are pulling back. They're making it go on its own. Because you get up above 10 milliamps across on a muscle, and it makes the muscle what we call depolarize and contract. And that's my idea of working out. I want to get these things and just, you know, put them on the biceps, put them... Put on all the muscles you had to know for your class. And then just have it work me out. I'll lay down and watch a little TV and let my muscles twitch and whatever. I don't, you know. What? what? I had to do a you did? But they turned it up so high that they were worried they were going to hurt me. And they Okay, so involuntary muscle contraction. Now, is involuntary muscle contraction dangerous? It depends. If that involuntary muscle contraction is, you know, on your back, yeah, no big deal. But if it's across your intercostal muscles, then you do exactly this. You go, and you suffocate and die, right? That's bad, bad. So depending on where it is, that could be bad. So a little rule of thumb, if for some really bizarre reason, you have to touch a wire to determine if it's hot or not, and I can't imagine the situation where I have to do it. I mean, I did other things. Like when I was about 10, 
I, I had a light bulb that burned out in my bedside lamp. And so I took the old light bulb out and I was going to put a new one in. But I was afraid to put the new light bulb in if the lamp was on. Now, I was 10. It never crossed my mind that I could unplug the lamp. And I was like, well, how can I determine if this lamp is on? I'm not going to stick my finger in there. And then I had this great idea. I had a house key. And I had a plastic key ring. And so I held the plastic key ring and slowly lowered my key into the lamp. And then it arced and melted to the end of my key. And I knew it was on. And so I flipped the switch and then I put the light bulb in. My mom like freaked out like I was risking my life. I wasn't. Even though I was so, <laughs> so silly, I didn't think about unplugging it. Why was I safe? I had an insulator between me and that thing. It wasn't going to bite me. But, oh, uh, yeah. Moms, they don't understand. So, yeah, I got in trouble for that. Okay, so if you have to determine if something's live by touching it, you know, first thing to do is <laughs> throw something on it. You know, like, well, here's a piece of metal. I'm going to take this metal and toss it on there and see if anything happens. You know, do other things. But if you absolutely have to touch it, Make sure you touch it with the back of your hand. Because if you touch it with the back of your hand and it's hot, and it's hot enough to make your muscles contract, all you do is hit yourself in the face, right? Just a face palm. But if you go like this, you're going to grab onto it and you're going to go, ah, that's bad. Got that safety tip? The important thing is don't touch it at all. But if, I, I can't imagine why. Okay, up to 50 to 70 milliamps across the heart gives you fibrillations. What happens is your heart has the little sinoatrial node that is where you have a signal comes into the heart. And that electric signal then goes through the atria. Um, you guys probably don't know the heart. Well, I'm not going to get very far in today's lecture. We'll probably end with the heart. Here is how my EMT instructor drew a heart. It's really quite informative. You have over on the left side there, the vena cava. I should totally let, I don't know how to spell vena cava either. It's what? V-E-N-A. I know how to spell it. Okay. The vena cava, that's where blood comes into the heart. And then you have the Right and the left, these are the atria, or if you're old school, you can call them the auricles, A-U-R-I-C-L-E. And down here are the ventricles. The blood goes into your right atrium, and then there is a valve, and if I remember right, this is the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid because it has three valves that goes from the right atrium into the right ventricle. So, oh, I better finish it off and then we'll talk about it. You have on the other side the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve because the Pope's hat is called a mitre and it has two cusps um, that goes from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Coming out of, and my, my, my veins here are going to be the wrong direction, and arteries. You have the pulmonary artery where blood goes out of the right ventricle, comes back into the left atrium from the pulmonary vein. Oh no. No longer sensitive to the hand. And then you have the arch of aorta, which comes out of the ventricle and goes up. So let's just call this the aorta, which is where blood goes out of the left ventricle. Now, in terms of electrical signals, you have the SA node up here, sinoatrial node, and electricity goes all through the atria from that SA node 
And as it goes through the atria, it makes the muscle contract. And as it contracts, it pushes blood from the atria into, into the ventricles. Then that electrical signal is collected here at what's called the AV node. SA was sinal atrial. AV is atrial ventricular, right, between the atria and the ventricle. And the atrial ventricular node kind of collects the electrical signals, and then it has them go down here through this thing called the bundle of hiss. That's how you spell hiss. And it gets down here, and then you have these things called Purkinje fibers that actually go into the muscle of the ventricles and make it fire. Now, what's going on is the first part where the electrical signal is going through the atria causes the atria to constrict, pushing blood through the tricuspid and bicuspid valves into the ventricles. Then these valves, because they have these flaps, blood can go through like this, but then they slap closed and blood's not supposed to go back through them. If it does, well, then you get a little murmur. And then the ventricles, when they fire, those are the big muscles. The pulmonary, vent, or the right ventricle, pushes blood through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Now, the lungs should not be a big impediment to blood flow. So the right ventricle doesn't have to do a lot of work. The blood pressure on that side is supposed to be somewhere in the ballpark of 25 millimeters of mercury. Goes through the lungs, gets oxygenated, and comes back to the left atrium from the pulmonary vein. So now we have oxygen coming through the pulmonary vein. It's the only vein in the body that has oxygenated blood. It's a vein because it's coming into the heart. The pulmonary artery is not oxygenated. It's the only artery with the not oxygenated blood because it's going from the heart out to the lungs. Okay, it comes down into the left ventricle and that's the part that pumps the, the blood through the body. That's the part that really has to work. So that's the big bulky part of the heart muscle. So the heart has a shape that's not symmetrical like this. It's more, you know, like this because this side here is the big bulky left side. Now, you have rhythms of electricity that's making all of this happen. And when you get up to somewhere between 50 and 70 milliamps of current going through the heart, what it will do is it will make the current flow wrong. It will make the current do things like... That's not good, right? As my EMT teacher, the one who taught me to make the square, said, your heart just jiggles and quivers. But it doesn't push blood anywhere because it just has muscles randomly spasming. That's bad. Now, if you have a heart attack, <laughs> there are different kinds of heart attacks you can have, but generally you're going to have something that is either causing it to not be coordinated or not push blood right. And there's lots of different bad rhythms. What do they do if you have a heart attack? One of the things they do is they shock you. They put a defibrillator on there and they put a current through the heart. Now that seems like it would be bad, right? But it's already bad. And what they're hoping to do with that current, do you know, Andrew? Yeah, it's supposed to reset it pretty much and, and kill the electrical current happening and re hopefully it will come back as a normal current. The idea is you put enough current that you make all of the heart muscle go, yeah, and stop. And then hopefully it'll start up on its own. And if it doesn't, well, they just killed you. But hey, you weren't going to live, so they just took you out of your misery. They're, they were like veterinarians. Ah, the horse got a broken leg. <laughs> Too bad for him. Okay. So that, that's why they shock you. They're trying to put enough current in there to stop the heart. But when you're doing the shock protocols, you don't start at the maximum setting on the defibrillator. You start at a low setting because you are going to burn some tissue. And if you can stop the heart with a lower current, you're going to cause less damage. So that's why they start low. Uh, a few more things. Let us say that you have had a heart attack that just killed your atria. The atria don't work at all. 
What does that do to you? You have nothing to push the blood from the atria into the ventricles. Actually, no. It only reduces efficiency by, by 20 to 30%. So your heart still works okay. It just drains in instead of being pumped in. Now, if your ventricle muscle dies, that's bad. Okay, we're out of time. Wow, I, I got through a third of my slides. A little proud. We talked about safety. And I forgot. No touch sensitive.